Hi, Cass. Hi, Lisa. How's it going? I'm good. How are you doing? I'm good. I'm so glad that you agreed to come on and share your story. I know this is something that maybe you haven't done a lot before in sharing, especially on a podcast, right? Well, it's first time on a podcast, but I do uh, share my story pretty frequently um, okay. when it's appropriate. I think that uh, like we've talked about, it's really important for people to understand um, how often stuff like that happens. And by not talking about it, then you're sort of further, um, I think, ostracizing mm -hmm. other women and like creating the shame cycle that or shame spiral even that goes with uh, pregnancy loss. Yeah, an I know. And we're having this conversation in real time. It is pregnancy loss awareness month. And you and I are good well, friends. Stillborn infants as well. Um, so yes, pregnancy and infant loss awareness month, right? Yes. Stillborn. I know. I just, I'm so grateful to you for agreeing to come on and just open up and share. You and I are good friends. We're neighbors here. And I love, I mean, you've helped reintroduce me back into my love for hot yoga. And <laughs> I just think it's funny that we're sitting on zoom and we're like three houses away from each other. I know just a few houses. Away. <laughs> I know. If I'd planned ahead, maybe we would, we would have done this in person, but we're here just chatting. Well, and we just kind of, yeah, this didn't come to, it wasn't a plan for this month. Right. Thing, yeah. But. I mean, kind of spur of the moment. So you and I met back in like, was it 2018, 2019? When we were on the uh, social 2018. committee. 2018 for the social committee here in our neighborhood. <laughs> Bonded over our love for a community and putting on events. And I didn't know you and before then, but what all that you had gone through. Right pregnancy loss and stillborn loss. And I just um, wanted to bring you on to share stories that I haven't really highlighted before on my podcast that I do want to share all the different sides of fertility. And this is a real thing that many women struggle with that fertility treatments don't always work out. Yeah. So I just am so grateful to you for being here and for opening up. And I kind of wanted to open it up with you know, you, you and Andy, you've been married for, is it eight years, right? Yes. We just we've been married so about the same amount of time. in August. Yeah. Okay. And so when you and Andy got together, he had a son who was two Jackson. Yeah. And, um, was that something as far as you also wanting to have children with Andy together? Was that something you guys planned kind of early on? Was it like, I want to, um, well, I think that we both, uh, so we met in 2012, um, just mm -hmm. after Jax turned two. And then I met Jackson a few months after we started dating because we were doing a long distance uh, mm -hmm. thing because we met in passing because of a missed flight uh, in a province in Canada that neither one of us lived in. Um, yeah, that's and... a cool story. I just wanted to share that too. You were in <laughs> Canada. Tell me, tell us that real quick, how you guys okay. met. Yeah. So I, uh, used to work for the Canadian Human Rights Commission. I'm Canadian. Uh, I'm actually Korean Métis, which is Indigenous from Canada. Um, and, uh, anyways, I worked for the Canadian Human Rights Commission. I used to travel around to a whole, like, Indigenous communities. There's over 600 in Canada. And I used to travel around and talk about what your rights responsibilities, blah, 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 teaching, uh, classes. And so I was in Alberta, which is basically just north of us here in Colorado, like very, you know, mm -hmm. quite a bit north, but still north. Mm -hmm. uh, anyways, and I was uh, staying at a Ramada by the Edmonton airport um, and happened to bump into Andy because he missed a flight. He was working on an assignment in northern Alberta, so even further north than we were, uh, and didn't realize that stopping for a burger on you know the Canadian side would end up getting him stuck overnight because he missed the deadline for the window to get through to the states um anyways and so we met and I was meeting up with a friend for dinner and I was like can I invite a cute American to, to come for dinner and uh he he took us both out for dinner and we started talking and that was 11 years ago just a couple weeks ago um awesome. and so yeah we uh, he already had been through, you know, marriage and was freshly divorced by a couple of months um, and had Jackson, who at the time had just turned two. 
Uh, mm -hmm. And so one of the things I always say, like one of the things that always attracted me to Andy was that he was, he's an amazing father. And like, he always put Jackson first, even through really difficult times. And, mm -hmm. um, and that was an attractive thing. And I always, you know, thought about having kids, but I really was more focused on finding the right person to do that because coming from, uh, you know, being an accident myself and no. coming from parents that work together, um, I, I understand sort of the, you know, I always wanted to, it was more important to find the person and like my mm -hmm. mom and my stepdad, who I refer to as my parents, they've been together for uh, a lot of years now since I was mm -hmm. there for, um, mm -hmm. but anyways, uh, so I also know about blended families, um, but being indigenous, uh, we have certain values and traditions and, and principles that, you know, we're taught. And part of that is you know, that children in general are, are pretty special and same thing with elders and, and as, you know, people uh, and adults, especially we have an obligation to children and, and our elders. Um, mm. And so, yeah, I, you know, we, I knew I wanted a family and Andy obviously knew he wanted a family because he had already, you know, started down that path. Mm -hmm. um, and then, but we didn't get married for a few years and like, we didn't intend to have kids until after we got married. And then, mm -hmm. uh, so we got married in 2015 and very quickly got pregnant, like as in on our mini moon. Uh, <laughs> and so it wasn't planned, um, at that mm -hmm. point, like it was sort of a, you know, yeah, we'll get into that. Um, and then we actually had a miscarriage at eight weeks, wow. um, but did not know that we had a miscarriage because my body hung on to everything. And so we didn't actually find out uh, until three weeks later when we went in for our first ultrasound. Because what some women who may not know if they've not been pregnant before is that usually your first pregnancy, especially if you're, you know, young and, and whatever, um, and, and have gotten pregnant uh, without trouble, Mm -hmm. uh, they usually don't schedule your first ultrasound until close to the end of your first trimester. So I was 11 weeks at the time, mm -hmm. um, but measurements and, and all of that showed that the baby's heart had stopped beating at about eight and a half weeks. Mm -hmm. um, and so I had to go through, first they tried like, well, naturally your body will get rid of it, you know, so we'll just wait for things to naturally sort of flush themselves out if you want to think of it that way uh and that didn't happen so after four or five weeks um of that not happening um I was given the choice to try some medication or to have surgery uh and so I decided to do the surgery because of the fact that we had already been going through it for so long and there was no guarantee that the medication was going to work and um it had added enough trauma <laughs> just dealing with the weeks and weeks of like waiting, you know, and having to go in every week and take blood work and, you know, all these tests and mm -hmm. all that stuff. Um, and so had my first uh, DNC, which talk about trauma in the US on paperwork, it's called an abortion, regardless of the reasons why you're having it or the circumstances surrounding it. Right. Mm -hmm. and so it was like super traumatic in the first place. And for the record, I am pro-choice because it is a woman's body. And after the story I'm going to tell you, I think you can understand why, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I believe that at the end of the day, every woman knows what's best for her. Uh, but when you are trying to have children, and then it goes on the medical record as you having an abortion, it mm -hmm. still is a little bit like it hurts, right? Mm -hmm. Um and so that was our first, <laughs> our mm -hmm. first round. And then like very, very quickly, we got pregnant again. Uh, once everything had been, you know, fixed mm -hmm. up. And uh, that time we went in earlier because of course our, our OB was like, let's check because about six, six weeks is when you can start to hear a heartbeat. Mm -hmm. um, and so we had gone in, I want to say like seven or eight weeks and it was a blighted ovum, uh, which is less terrible. And I say that only because there isn't actually any type of fetus. What it is, is uh, a woman's gestational sac has started, but no, the second half, which would be the embryo has not actually formed. And so mm. it's essentially, you know, an empty sac when you go to look, um, which is of course, again, very heart wrenching when you're trying to have children, but like on the scheme of um, the impact that it can have, it's a little different, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but was still again sucked. And so we tried medication this time right away because my doctor knew 
you know, uh, that my body didn't necessarily, wasn't going to like shed uh, the, the mm. issue in the lining that was necessary. Mm. Uh, and so I went through two rounds of medication and it did not work. <sighs> Um, and without getting too graphic, this is a medication that you have to administer vaginally. So like there's, you know, there's thing, it's not just pop a couple pills and and move on. Right. So it's de definitely, there's like an invasive aspect to all of this, mm -hmm. um, as it is. And none of that worked. So I went through two rounds of that didn't work. So then I headed in for my second abortion, <sighs> um, and at that point, given that I was, I want to say I was like 35, um, mm -hmm. just about to, or maybe turning 36, somewhere in there. Because we got married when I was, uh, oh no, I guess I would have been like 33 or 34. Anyways. Okay. okay. Uh, but on the earlier side of 30s, but my history, my family, like my, uh, my grandmother went through early menopause, uh, but she also had a child late right before she went through menopause and uh, my mother had different issues uh, in terms of she had four miscarriages between myself and my youngest uh, brother, who's 11 mm. years younger than I am. Um, yeah. And so our doctor gave us the choice that we could, you know, try once more naturally because we were really getting pregnant didn't seem to be a challenge. Um, or she could refer us to a specialist. Um, and so mm -hmm. we went the route of the specialist because just everything we'd already been through, it was like, let's just... Yeah get on that train now and mm -hmm. deal with it. Um, excuse me. And so uh, we went to uh, CCRM, which is a facility here in Colorado, very mm -hmm. you know, uh, well-respected, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, and we had a really great experience in terms of the staff and, and everything. I know I've heard different stories because we had friends that were going through similar stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and not every nurse is created equal, right? But just like every teacher is not created equal, just like every doc, you know, like people, mm -hmm. it, some people are better at their jobs than others, right? And yeah. I, was lucky. I had a really good experience. Um, and we got in our first, so they suggested IUI because they do all these tests. Again, you get to be poked and prodded and go in for blood work, like all the days of the week and every point in your cycle and all these things. Let me ask you, Cass, was there, were there any medical diagnoses at this time? Did they identify like they just said IUI, we think this will be well, good. So no, there is, it's not so much that there was a medical diagnosis, but I did have like the potential, like less eggs than most people my age, mm. right? Uh, but still had healthy eggs. You know, Andy's uh, motility count was really good. Like we didn't have any, it was more just the thinking was that like, as you age, less of your eggs are, you know, a hundred percent. And so mm -hmm. the thinking was that like, we just happened to have a couple of, you know, situations where, and in the first time, because I wasn't planning, like I had been, you know, drinking and I had been, you know, um, working out really heavily and things like that, that actually like even working out and it's so counter, but you have to, like, once I went into IUI, I wasn't allowed to get my um, heartbeat above 120 mm. uh, for the duration of the time that I was like in uh, you know, going through the fertility because they give you all kinds of pills and stuff to like be able to test your count and like multiply yeah. the opportunity and stuff like that. Uh, but so there wasn't any, like, I don't have, you know, like I've heard women have PCOS that can be very difficult or endometriosis mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. you know, but I did, um, I did go through puberty really early. Like I was nine. Um, and oh, wow. so, so really, you know, where I'm at in terms of like having sort of the slightly older, there's also that theory that like, just because I was younger and so you oh. only have so many eggs as you, yeah. you know, age, right? Yeah. Um, wow, nine, that's really young. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, very young. And, mm. um, and so like that, you know, they said mm -hmm. that might be why, but like there wasn't yeah. anything that was... Um, Okay. Okay. Exactly. Identified. So they led you to IUI and you said, okay, let's, let's go for it. Yeah. And so for those who may not know IUI, basically it's less invasive than IVF. You are still going through, you're taking pills at different times, like estrogen and progesterone and things to help, uh, you know, enhance your cycle and you're producing, they're keeping an eye through, um, ultrasound to make sure like when it when you're ovulating basically right mm -hmm. and so they identify okay you ovulate turns out that my cycle is shorter than most women's mm -hmm. so average is 28 and people always think okay everybody's got 28 but like a girlfriend of mine she's got a 40-day cycle 
And she didn't find that out until she started trying to get pregnant. Mm -hmm. And whereas I have like a 25, 26 day cycle and have Mm -hmm. always had a shorter cycle, um, but was on birth control. So it was controlled, you know, um, medically. Yeah. Anyways, but my natural cycle was shorter. So we go through all these tests and they find out when you're ovulating. And then the really fun, you know, sexy part is that you both get to go into separate rooms and they like speed up uh, the sperm with like a little bit of caffeinated juice, basically whatever it is. Um, And then you're on, you know, in the stirrups where every woman wants to be. And (laughs) they insert the, 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 sort of hyped up sperm right Mm -hmm. and the idea is that you are ovulating at that time so ideally things are going to come together you know in that next few days they also of course tell you to go home have lots of sex you get to hang out with your legs up in the stirrups for like 10 minutes you know it's really fun (laughs) um and (laughs) and so that was our first go right and so lo and behold we got pregnant on our first go yeah i worked on your first three rounds um, like three months in a row is what I mean. Wait, say that one more time. So it worked on your first try. Yeah. So our first month they worked, but they say that it didn't work because for some women it doesn't, then they'll let you do up to two more rounds. So two more months in a row, right. A three month Mm -hmm. period, just because of all of the hormones and different things that they're doing to your body. Mm -hmm. Um, that's sort of there generally, they won't allow more than that. Um, and then they'll start to look at other alternatives, right? right but so we got right. pregnant right away. And then at six weeks, they had you come in to do an ultrasound to wait for a heartbeat. And like, you're being monitored all through this. Your numbers are all being checked and like, yeah, lots and yeah. lots of blood work. Um, and then, uh, so at six weeks, we found out that we were not having one healthy baby, but two. Uh, mm-hmm. And so we uh, got to go in and, and it was funny because of course they're checking around. You have no idea what they're looking at. Um, Mm -hmm. and then they were like, oh, and here's one, you know, and here they are, or here it is kind of thing is what the doctor said. And then Mm -hmm. here's the other one. And, um, so it was like, it felt like that, like double blessing because of, you know, we'd lost, Mm -hmm. already had two losses and all of that. Um, and I remember like driving home so excited and calling my boss and telling her and, um, and, that was, everything was great. And of course we'd been like, you know, doing all of the things. So there was no, you know, potential for, you know, like I hadn't been drinking and he wasn't drinking, you know, like all, you're doing all the things. Right. Plus I was Mm -hmm. making sure that I wasn't raising my, I was still working out, but that Mm -hmm. was the first time I got myself a Fitbit. Um, and that was to start because I wasn't allowed to go over 120, even in my first trimester. Okay. And so then we made it through our first trimester. Um, very exciting, confirmed that we were having a boy and a girl. Um, and, you know, had started to tell people because like there wasn't really much hiding it within even within the first few months, because um, I'm a pretty petite person. Mm-hmm. And like there there was a picture my cousin took. She was uh, also pregnant, but she was um, 14 weeks, I think. I want to say, or I was 14 or something. We were not very many weeks apart, but I was bigger than her. Um, But I was like less weeks than she was. Mm -hmm. Um, Anyways, and so it was like all good. We went through our first trimester. Everything was good through our second and midway through our second, uh, about 17 weeks, I had some spotting. Mm -hmm. And so we went in to the doctor and my OB um, had been on leave during this time. And so I was seeing sort of different doctors within the, the same clinic. Mm -hmm. Um, But so not my doctor and not a constant same person. Right. But Mm -hmm. anyways, I went in, they did an ultrasound, no evidence of anything. He's like, everything is fine. Go home. Like, we'll see you in four weeks for your 21 week ultrasound. Mm -hmm. Um, And so we went home and then about three and a half weeks later at 21 weeks, uh, we had just bought this house that we're living in now mm-hmm. um, and move, we're moving in. Um, and five days after we purchased this house, uh, I had started having pain mm-hmm. um, and thought that it was indigestion. And um, then uh, like Andy had softball and I was still in a lot of pain, but like we had just moved and, and stuff. And then um at one point, I didn't know it, but my water with my daughter broke. 
Um, Mm. and I called the clinic and like Andy was at softball. So I called him and I called the clinic and the nurse was like, oh, I'm sure it was nothing like, you know, this, I, I didn't know that my water broke though. So I was just saying like, I think there's something wrong and I'm in a lot of pain Mm. and so on and so forth. And she asked a few questions and then basically said that like it, you know, it was likely just this not to worry about it. And that Mm. if something had happened, then given that I was only 21 weeks, there wouldn't be anything they could do anyways. Um, (sighs) and Andy wasn't home yet. And so I just continued in pain and so on and so forth. (sighs) Then he came home and, uh, like, again, we both just thought that like, I wasn't feeling well. Um, and so ended up like sleeping. I didn't really sleep through the night. It was really uncomfortable, but I stayed. What kind of pain were you feeling that? Um, Well, just lots of like discomfort. Um, and and what it turned out was labor pain, but I didn't know that. Um, and I have a pretty high pain tolerance. Mm. Um, and so I was in a lot of pain, but again, like I, so I had been very worried and then, uh, like everybody had told me like, you need to stop worrying. You need to stop stressing out. And so about a week and a half before I had like said, okay, we're, you know, we're almost through our second trimester. Like I need to stop worrying because the stress isn't going to help. Uh, mm-hmm. and so here's the part, well, I will say, uh, ladies always advocate for yourself. Um, and even if you don't want to know what's wrong, uh, you should still believe yourself. Cause basically like, I didn't want to be overreacting because mm-hmm. everybody was telling me that I was overreacting, including this doctor the few weeks before and whatever. Um, and so basically, <laughs> Andy was going away to work the next day and like Jackson was here. He was only seven uh, at the time. He had just turned uh, seven mm-hmm. um, a couple weeks before because it was July. And um, Andy left for the airport and then he missed a flight because he was like not wanting to leave. And I was like, no, it'll be fine. It'll be fine. Um, I'm sure I'm just not feeling well. Like there's, you know, I'm sick or something. And mm-hmm. then um he called and said that he had missed the flight. He could go or did I want him to come home? And I asked him to come home. Uh, and when he got home, my fever was 104. And like, I had already called my doctor's office. We had already like taken these steps, but nobody had gotten back to me yet. Mm-hmm. Um, and so when he got home, my fever was 104. He was about to take me in and called our doctor. And then the doctor was like, oh, yes, bring her in. Um, and so by then I was like almost septic and dilated a couple of inches or a couple centimeters, excuse me. And then, um, mm. uh, we went into the medical center here where we were supposed to be giving birth and, uh, ended up having to be, I had to be airlifted to a hospital downtown. And because when you get airlifted, there's only room for you, a nurse and the mm. pilot basically. And so Andy had to drive downtown, uh, and it was a four and a half minute uh, helicopter ride and he made it there in 20 minutes which if you know where we live we're about a half hour north on a good day from mm-hmm. uh, mm-hmm. and so the fact that he made it there in like 20 minutes he's like I don't mm-hmm. remember like yeah was, yeah no. um but yeah and so we ended up uh giving birth to our daughter that afternoon and of course she was too young to make it on her own um and then I gave birth to our son later on that evening. Uh, so it was technically the next day. It was like 1.30 in the morning. Um, and so they like they had talked about at one point trying to, you know, consider trying to save one. Um, but there was a possibility, like, because of how sick I already was, that like I would die. And mm-hmm. and Andy was pretty clear that like he could not lose me too. So that was not really mm-hmm. an option. Um and so we, you know, got to spend a day with our babies and they take them while you're asleep and, you know, bathe them and dress them. And there are folks who go through, you know, similar things and donate clothes and blankets and, and things. And, and I'm sure that some of those packages are for folks who end up in the NICU and, and stuff like that as well. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and they like do footprints and handprints and pictures and, And stuff like that. Um, And so, you know, they give you time to say goodbye and things. And then, um, yeah, we came home. um, And it 
took a minute to <laughs> to get over things. Um, but yeah, it was. I can't imagine the um. So we decided because, of course, they ask you if you want to name them and and all that kind of stuff, and so sort of um. I think it was hopefully uh, with optimism uh, we decided that we would give them our second choice names mm. uh, because we wanted to have the opportunity to use our first choice names because oh. uh, we like we had decided you know even then that we would keep trying um, and so that night after I had our son uh, I had to go in for another DNC um, and part of that. So again, another abortion um, <laughs> part of that was to make sure they get everything out because of the infection, right? You don't want to, and I have a very horrible story again to tell about this, but not about me, but another warning um, that I learned about around the same time. Uh, Cause once you start going through these things, whether it's a, a miscarriage or a blighted ovum or, mm -hmm. uh, you know, a stillbirth or whatever, that's when all of a sudden you start, you know, learning and hearing like one of my very good friends who has three kids shared with me that, you know, they had to have a, an abortion at 23 and a half weeks because they found out their daughter did was short a chromosome. And like, so the, at that point, I mean, this was, you know, 20 years ago, but at mm -hmm. that point they thought like there was, if she lived, it would be for a very short period of time once they gave birth and like her quality of life would be, you know, horrendous. And they were living in California at the time. They had to fly to New York to be able to get a late term abortion, wow. um, you know, but it was medically necessary. Uh, mm -hmm. And and again, it's silly because I understand like it's all medical terminology and that's why, but it goes to show you. And I think this speaks to why you chose to go the path you did, Lisa, um, but it's like that's all the medical, like factual, whatever. So it's all the same. We go in, we do the same pr procedure. So like, we'll just call mm. it all the same thing. Mm. Right? And for women going through that, it's not the same thing. It's, you know, and, and to be, especially here in the States with the controversy around choice and abortion, um, you know, to have on your medical record that you've had multiple abortions, mm. um, again, being pro-choice or not, yeah. it's like, that's not a, especially when you consider that it's, again, related to loss and being medically necessary and, and not mm -hmm. um, choice. And, and I'm not trying to in any way create shame for women who do choose, because again, I can understand that at certain points in life or for your whole life, um, and if you know you're not going to be a good parent, don't be. Uh, it's mm -hmm. so much better because uh, we all know shitty parents. Sorry. Uh, no. Yeah, it's all good. But, um, anyhow, uh, for but for me, that was like a it was a traumatic and hurtful like piece yeah. of the reality. Mm -hmm. um, and and so and the shame that kind of like just sort of. Yeah. Um, I feel yeah. like it's associated to kind of that stuff and then even just loss. Right. And like uh, for us, the, the final diagnosis was that I'd had an abruption, which is basically an unexplained detachment of the, the baby from the placenta. Um, and they can happen at any point for any number of reasons. Um, mm -hmm. But part of what added to sort of layers of our case is that I'm RH negative. So I'm O negative, um, which is my blood type mm -hmm. uh, and very, very rare, but it's a universal blood type. So everybody can use my blood, but only I can use my blood. Oh. <laughs> like I, I can't get blood from multiple sources the way mm -hmm. that other people can. Um, and I actually had to have four pints. Uh, I had to have a transfusion the next day after I'd had the surgery and after we'd, mm -hmm. you know, had our children. Um, mm -hmm. I had to get four pints of blood, which wow. is like mm -hmm. half your blood. <laughs> uh, and it takes a long time. It takes like hours for that process. And so mm -hmm. just, like, um, and, and so like very grateful for blood donation. Um, mm -hmm. me you know, too. <laughs> and yeah, it's, it's something that I think people don't necessarily always get to understand where it's going, but like, it, oh, yeah. you know, um, it does, it saves <laughs> lives. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, it was, uh, 
it was really tough. And the the worst part was, so the DNC that I had that night, they couldn't put me under because of all the other medications that they had me on and the antibiotics and, and all these things. Um, and so I got to be awake for it. I was like, happily awake if that you know because again they have you like on all the things um but it was very like surreal to have to be conscious for that and to then like later in dealing with again the trauma of everything to have that memory Mm. because I definitely do you know Mm. um and uh yeah so that was all like just so so difficult um And then even so we went, you know, like I said, we were very dedicated to the idea of continuing to try. Mm -hmm. Um, We went back to CCRM and I got to have another DNC uh, because they just wanted, you know, clean up, make sure everything was good. Uh, You know, make make sure things were good for hosting again, I guess. Mm -hmm. Uh, But they might have maybe gotten a little too excited or something because we have not been, I've not been on any type of birth control or anything else, but we have not been able to, we had a, uh, another blighted ovum, um, in March of 2018. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, and that one actually the medic, cause we were doing the IUI at that mm-hmm. point. Right. And mm-hmm. that was our third round of the IUI, but it caused a cyst. And so the cyst burst. And so it appeared as though, uh, like through blood work, it appears as though I was pregnant, but then when they went in to look like my ovaries and everything had like filled with fluid, and I was in all this pain because the cyst had burst and all this kind of all at once, right? Um, that was your third round of IUI? Yeah, on our second try, right? So like okay. we had one round of IUI, got pregnant, went through that, had our losses. Mm-hmm. Once I was deemed to be like healed enough, which was a few months. Like it was, mm-hmm. like I said, our third round was, I think we started in January of 2018 and we lost the twins in July of 2017. So mm-hmm. there was some months of healing and like mm-hmm. going through surgeries and healing and, and things mm-hmm. like that. Um, but so we did three rounds of IUI. Total. Okay. The closest we got was the blighted ovum that mm-hmm. then sent me back to like, I was in a lot of pain um, because his cysts hurt. And I understand that like there are women who not even related to pregnancy have cysts that burst on a regular basis. So for those Mm -hmm. ladies, I am so sorry because it is so painful. Um, And also was like, again, kind of traumatic because again, here we are like with all this stuff to deal with um, and at the end, you know, no success. Um, But that was the last time that I came like close to being pregnant that I know of. Um, And we... So at this point, and I think you asked this question the first time I ever shared this with you was like, so then what about IVF, right? And I'm sure especially folks listening to this podcast are probably thinking that as well. So like, where do you get to the IVF part? Mm -hmm. Um, And one of the things when we were, you know, we talked about that with Mm -hmm. the CRM and we talked about, you know, that option. And of course they would have been willing to try, you know, anything that we wanted but they were also acknowledged that like our challenge was not so much having a healthy pregnancy like the uh, a healthy insemination or healthy pregnancy mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. um it more there seemed to be some something stemming in terms of like my ability to carry right mm-hmm. um and it could be cuz Andy is positive blood rh positive and I'm rh negative and one of the things so I had to have shots at when I was pregnant, but also after we lost each loss okay. um, at three months and at another point, because they give you, it's um some sort of medication that basically goes in and protects the foreign blood antibodies. So the RH positive antibodies that exist in your body because of having had the pregnancy mm-hmm. with someone who has positive blood and you having negative, because what mm-hmm. can happen is your body can actually see that as foreign and reject it mm-hmm. and then build up an immunity to those is to the RH positive. So that then if you try to get pregnant again, essentially will attack the child mm-hmm. or not child, but the embryo, yeah, right? Yeah, because yeah. it mm-hmm. thinks that it is a foreign body. But so the way they described it to us is like, imagine that you have nice round blood platelets and 
you know, Andy's are spiky. What this does is it goes in and it puts, you know, a nice round coating around his spikes so that they blend in with my blood, right? Mm -hmm. That way my body isn't going to, you know, react and it allows us to be able to, you mm -hmm. know, move forward in the future. What I want to know is before they <laughs> did this, my, I always said this to Andy, I was like, before they had this stuff, like how many, you know, poor women not knowing that like their just blood type was potentially impacting you know, how the success they're having or not. Wow. Like, yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but obviously it was something that medical science picked up pretty quick uh, once it started down the road, because my understanding has been around for quite some time. Um, but anyhow, and so uh, when we talked about IVF, it was, yes, so we could go through all of that, but then we could still end up at, you know, five and a half months, mm -hmm. for the same thing that we did. And the the challenge is that medical science cannot support a fetus outside of the womb prior to 24 weeks. And so, you know, having never made it to 24 weeks carrying, that was sort of like for us was the big, you know, like, yeah, okay, we can go through all of this cost and we would have paid it all, right? Like that's, as you know, you figure it out because money mm -hmm. is money. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And like that would have been an option, but for us, we weren't convinced that like we would actually make it through. So the, in terms yeah. of pregnancy, so then we kind yeah. of considered the possibility of surrogacy. Mm -hmm. um, and, but certainly like at that time, uh, so in Canada, surrogacy is actually, you cannot pay a surrogate. They have to do it ultra and so like I have friends I mean you still because medical care is free and stuff it's less of an issue as well so you're not you know like I had a friend who um another she couldn't get pregnant and so mm -hmm. another friend was her surrogate she'd already had three kids and was like done having kids but didn't mind being pregnant and so they still you know supported her to have time off after wow. she had the baby and stuff like that mm -hmm. um but it wasn't a by any means a financial uh, arrangement, right? Mm -hmm. uh, whereas here, it very much is a financial arrangement. And often you're looking at like the salary, like a livable salary for someone for a year. Um, and then you have to also let go of your, you have to be able to, I think, trust in a way that I might not have been to, able to mm -hmm. at that point because mm -hmm. it is someone else who's still, you know, this stranger that you're paying to do this thing. Um, mm -hmm. And so, I mean, yeah, we didn't, I don't know how much we you didn't, you didn't want to go down that road. <laughs> yeah. Like it just wasn't something that, yeah, I don't know. So you kind of came to the conclusion together. Like we're going to kind of close this chapter. Well, it was more like we didn't necessarily close it, but we were done with the like medical intervention and the, okay. yeah, all of that. Cause like as silly as it sounds, like I have, you know, a nice little track mark in one arm because of the number of times that I had blood drawn. Right. Oh. And even if you're switching arms all the time, when you're going in like yeah. every week for months at a time, right. those things add up. Right. Um, mm -hmm. and, and we were just done with like yeah. all of that. Uh, yeah. and so then, you know, over time, like I said, we never got pregnant again. And, on the upside, I haven't had to take birth control. Yeah. Uh, so at least I'm not being, you know, in that way, but like, um, obviously it was devastating for us. Yeah, very we much. We would love to have had more kids. And like, we bought this house, we upsized our home at the time mm -hmm. because we thought we were going to have more kids. We had like spent that weekend painting their bedrooms, you know, like it was um, really tough. And like, it was really hard at the time to, you know, have to explain to Jackson yet again. And like, those things he doesn't really remember like he actually a while ago because he's 13 now mm -hmm. uh, and this was you know probably a couple years ago now but he sort of asked about it and had no recollection we had like shown him the pictures and we talked with him when we got home and and things um and uh you know he um had no recollection of having seen any of that or mm -hmm. like recalled being part of you know those conversations and I mean, he was young, so yeah. 
you don't pick and choose necessarily what you do remember or not, right? right. Um, and so we kind of had that same conversation with him at that time and, and kind of said, like, we did just, you know, we did share these things with you um, at that point. Um, and mm-hmm. so, yeah, so like we have, you know, we have a picture in our bedroom um, of uh, Emma and Vaughn were their names. And then um, Emma and Vaughn. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then I, so I was really depressed <laughs> um, to say the very least. Uh, and like, just so like, even just the body, like, you know, I remember coming home and being in the shower and like not being able to look down, you know, just cause I didn't even want to like see that I was no longer pregnant. Right. Mm-hmm. And like, um, just so much like blame and so much because grief is like you're always looking for something right and even the bargaining like when I was being airlifted I guess even before uh all I was saying apparently like repeatedly was just let my babies be okay and like at that point it was like clearly bargaining because clearly things weren't okay right and like I already knew that but I wasn't going to acknowledge that yet, wasn't able to. Um, But so like the first, it's probably eight or nine months, I tried to like get through it on my own um, in terms of like just trying to move on and deal with it and whatever. And like, and because we were still trying and so there was still the hope and all that. And then once we went through, you know, in March of 2018 and went through all of that, um, it was a few months later that I started seeing a therapist because I realized like my grief was not because then it was really it was like at that point was really when I started to like sit in the grief because before that we were distracted by like trying again right and this mm-hmm. like I was so focused in the few months after all of it on like I gotta heal I gotta get better so that we can like mm-hmm. go again right mm-hmm. um so for those who don't know me I am a type a and I'm an overachiever so like I was ready to go um yeah and it like so it was like after that sort of round they got to really realize like okay so maybe this isn't gonna happen and and isn't at least gonna happen in the way we thought it would and whatever um and so then I started seeing a therapist and and like that was helpful um and then I you know she started asking about sort of what are the things that like help you and I had done yoga, you know, a long time ago. Um, and that, you know, the mindfulness and breath work and and things like that. And so I started going to hot yoga, hot vinyasa, um, which is a hot flow. Uh, mm-hmm. and that was like, I had done yoga before and I like liked it enough, but that was sort of in that hour, you're like, I just have to not die. And so it was like, I would, you know, for 60 minutes, able to finally like step outside of my own like voice in mm-hmm. my head that was like so punishing. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that helped. Um, she was but, the one that suggested that to you to consider. Oh, well, she had suggested comment? like finding things again that like mm-hmm. used to bring, you know, that could be helpful or that would, you know, yeah. help with exercise and stuff. Cause like, we're still trying to, my husband's very active and like, I'm very active and yeah. the gym, but like, I was finding at the gym that like, I just didn't care because it was so like sad. I was like, mm-hmm. I don't care about doing this workout. And like, and then, you know, you're not really in it. So it wasn't giving me the benefits that it would have been if I had been like, it was sort of half-assing it, if you will, just begrudgingly going. Cause again, it was like, I was begrudgingly going through life for like a while. Mm -hmm. Um, and Andy is very much a like doer when he's grieving. Whereas I was like, I just want to sit in a puddle of self-pity, just leave me here in my puddle. Um, and so luckily he didn't do that. Um, thank you for sharing that real, that's real, that's real life, you know? Yeah. Um, well, and we like, there was so most people when they go through stuff like this um the divorce rate is like way up there um for various reasons right um and that was like uh there was even someone very early on who's important to both of us uh and I'm 
I won't get into details because I know this podcast, but essentially Mm -hmm. their first question after everything happened was, are you guys going to stay together? (sighs) And it was like, I still haven't let that go. And that's on me. Right. There's Mm -hmm. the fact that like, I still tell the story. There's still a little bit of me that is like upset with them that that was their first thought was not like, you Mm -hmm. know, that we could make it through that. It was more like, well, you know, you've been through all this and like, usually what will happen is (sighs) go your own way. Right. Wow. Um, But we didn't, we had to, there was definitely like, I was so angry at everybody and everything. And like, Andy was not immune from that by any means. Um, Mm -hmm. And, you know, we had to do a lot of our own, like getting through that and talking and and things. Um, Yeah. And on the upside, we did. I mean, we're still married. We're still in yeah. love. And like, yeah. you know, we look through the things that we've been through. Um, and obviously, like if we could, there are certain things we change. But at the same time, it has um, we didn't allow it to divide us. We powered through. Right. Um, which wasn't easy because, like I said, it took me a long time. Like Andy had an easier time sort of with just moving on. And part of that, I think, you know, it's not just because, oh, he's a guy, but part Mm -hmm. of that is that he didn't have to go through the same physical experience and trauma Mm -hmm. that Mm -hmm. I did while also going through this insane emotional trauma, right? Um, And that was one of the hardest things because like, even after like I gave birth, so like, you know, I still, my breast still swelled and I still had to like deal with all of these like post birth, like symptoms, right? But I didn't have any babies and it was like, so, so difficult. And so something that like, when I was in those moments of feeling really bad that like made it easy for me to like be mad at Andy because he wasn't going through both that physical, like your whole body being like, well, I don't even know what's going on. Mm -hmm. Um, and the emotional, right. And so like, there was a while for sure where, um, thankfully he, uh, put up with and called out that like, you know, there were times where I was just mad at him to be mad. Um, yeah. And yeah, we made it through yeah. you know, all that stuff. Um, so it sucks because as, I mean, as you know, like I, w- I mentioned sort of my culture earlier. Um, and so one of the things, like I call myself a bonus mom and I call yeah. Jackson a bonus son. Um, I hate the term step anything in part yeah. because I feel like it's a so easy to like demonize, especially step moms. Like, there's just this idea that like they have to be terrible and they have to obviously be like not about children that are not their own and and these kinds of things. And like, even before we ever had kids um, and Andy has shared with me, like one of the things that, you know, helped him see a future with me was the way that I was with Jackson when I first met Jackson and, <laughs> and things. Um, and again, it's not about like replacing parents or any of those things. It's about the belief that like love begets love and the more love that a kid yeah. has and support the better off they're going to be like in the yeah. long right and so that was how I had approached my relationship with Jackson from the beginning um and that's how I continue to approach it even after hmm. um but certainly that was hard too at times yeah. right because it's like that sort of thing that like when as I'm sure, especially folks listening to this podcast know, once you decide that you want to have a baby with somebody um, and you have found that person, then it's really hard to accept that that might not ever happen. Right. Um, Especially because like, I don't want to brag, but we're pretty good parents. You're amazing. Uh, Yeah. You're amazing. um, And I think, you know, we would have been just that much better had we had to do that for more kids. Right. But one of my uh, so very much again within my culture and believe everything happens for a reason. Yeah. Um, and a couple, couple pieces within that, you know, um, my bonus son has had lots of challenges. Um, and, you know, as one of my friends said, sort of when things are going on, they're just like, maybe part of that is that Jackson needs you two to be able to focus on him, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and that's, what we do, you know, that's what we were doing before. We didn't change that. Um, 
and and he's a pretty good kid and so oh it's like God. the you know that piece and then now like as we as I was saying to you this weekend so like now he's 13 mm -hmm. uh, and we're a little older and it's like yes we would absolutely trade like anything to have our kids be here they'd be turning six next month um you know, and it, it always sort of like kills me because as you know, we have a neighbor across the street who's got a daughter of six, you've got a daughter of six. Um, and like, they all would have been the same age. You know, um, we cry, Tess. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, yeah, it's that's, but like the thing too, is that, as you know, with Livy and, and yeah. with the other kids, yeah. like I don't hold that against anybody else. Um, and just like when it comes to other people getting pregnant, like there was a situation and this is something for folks who either have kids or don't want kids, but are talking with somebody who has had a loss, please don't ever patronize them and assume that you're being pregnant or you're having something that they don't means that they are somehow, you know, jealous of you or hurt by your happiness or any of those things, because most folks when they're able to heal part of healing is the like you're having you know the miracle that's livy isn't something like that doesn't take away or doesn't it's not something i'm going to hold against you right and it's not something that like i'm happy because you're happy and and so i i had a situation the reason i say this that i had a situation where you know a friend of mine who i'd met later and heard the story of my loss and you know uh because mm -hmm. i did yoga teacher training after uh after everything because again i started yeah. doing vinyasa and practicing and it was like it just was helping so much and so i took some time off of my day job and i just went and did my 200 hour teacher training and really at the time like i didn't know that if i wanted to teach or not it was more there's a lot of, you have to do a lot of practice, but also mm -hmm. there's a lot of sort of self-reflection and really it allows you to do so much work on yourself as you're going through this, right? And so that was why like I, I took teacher training in the first place. Um, and, but anyways, and so I, you know, shared this story and then later one of the people that I met got pregnant and and then when they told me and I was happy for them, right? And, you know, they, things were going well, and it was all natural. And even when I was happy for them in the conversation, they're like, are you sure? Because, you know, if you're sad, you can share that with me. Oh. And I was like, it made me feel really defensive, first of all, yeah. uh, you know, like it just right away, like made me kind of pissed at her. Yeah. Uh, but it, cause it was like, I'm sitting here and I'm telling you that I'm happy for you yeah. and I say congratulations and I'm wishing you well. So for you to then sit there and be like, are you sure? Because if I were you, like uh, that person was very much uh, projecting their own garbage onto me. Right. Yeah. Um, but in that moment, it like, it felt so shitty and it was very shaming because it was that whole thing uh, of like, you know, I recognize that I get to do this. And like, I think less of you because you didn't. It's mm, what it feels like, right? Wow. And that's not, I'm sure that wasn't her intention. Yeah. And I do, you know, in giving the benefit of the doubt, I feel like she was probably really trying to say like, I'm here if you need me. Mm. But just believe your friends. Yeah. Like when yeah. they say that they're happy for you. Yeah. Even if they're not, and they go and they talk to somebody else about how shitty they feel just yeah you know assume that they're being honest with you um and and assume that people are able to heal and still be happy for others yeah they're not having that same situation you know like that was something Andy and I had to accept mm -hmm. for sure is that like other people literally like what a baby's born like every second so like literally every second somebody's getting pregnant somewhere we're going to know a few of them in our lifetime, you know? Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And fingers crossed, Jackson's going to have some kids at some point, you know, like, yeah. but if you spend your whole life, you know, focused on the thing you didn't have, yeah. then, then yeah, that's going to be really miserable. Um, but that's not, that's not what we just said we wanted to do or anything. Yeah. And so 
you know, I just, I think it's really important that people recognize that you can be sad for your own self and like grieve within your own loss, but it doesn't mean that you have to transfer that. Yeah. To other people. Um, and, mm. and in the same way that it's like, you know, it obviously hurts my heart and I would like give anything to, to have my kids instead of the tattoo that I have. I wanted to, I wanted to, I wanted to bring that every, up. You led me, you led me to that. Um, yeah share about right. that um, how you honored how you honored your twins yeah uh so about a year and a bit later I was thinking about what I like something like we have um like I said we have a picture of them and like we have their ashes it's like the saddest little thing they're the like little tiniest bags of ashes but oh my gosh and we have my dad <laughs> so um my dad made a cedar box for me and um he put uh, animal fur inside it which is in in Métis culture it'd be a traditional way of lining a, a, a box like this and and so their ashes are in that and it's you know on a shelf in our living room um and it has a, a pot of killer whales carved on the box my dad's an artist wow. um with you know a beautiful sun uh, set or sunrise depending mm. on how you look at it mm -hmm. um and and you know, we, I think, certainly think about them, like, on their birthdays and things, um, and, but I wanted to do something, like, just to sort of imprint the fact, because, like, for me, it's obviously, like, imprinted on me forever, yeah. um, and so I designed a tattoo, um, <laughs> mm. that, uh, was sort of, um, I guess, to, to commemorate things yeah. to be, um, and to keep them close to me. Um, and so I put it on my left ankle. I don't even know if you're going to hear, well, get really funny here. Um, show my yoga skills. I can. <laughs> so if you can see it, it's upside yeah. down, but there yeah. is basically dandelions and then their seeds are going up into the sky and into like becoming parts of the stars and the moon it's so um, beautiful for those listening you'll have to visit the youtube channel to watch this yes <laughs> check it out but, um oh my gosh i just i'm i love how you've honored them and and within so within the, yeah. the stars and, and things their initials are are attached to oh. uh, to the dandelion seeds and so oh. the idea is that again it's you know demonstrative that they because they were both born in the evening slash night um and, oh. and I've always been like I got a thing with the moon um I think because I was born at night too uh but anyway mm -hmm. um and it, you know, it was sort of that multiple things in terms of the like dandelions, you know, you blow on them when mm. they have their seeds to make wishes and like, that's where all your sort of dreams are. Um, but then also that like they, you know, in that day went from being part of our, you know, dreams and, and hopes and stuff to being part of, you know, the stars in the sky. Oh my gosh. Um, oh my gosh. So this whole conversation, I'm just like. So glad I did my makeup. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so honored you're sharing all of this. And well, it's funny. I hope more people. I hope more people adopt the term bonus mom because I just think that's <laughs> amazing. You are like I'm so grateful to have you as a friend and a neighbor. And well, and and bonus moms, be sure to also adopt the term bonus son, bonus daughter, bonus kid, um, <laughs> bonus kids, uh, whatever. I mean, um, yeah, you you've even taken our daughter, like. <laughs> on fun adventures and it's just like wow like like you said how you take after you look after any kids in your life like it's so amazing it's so beautiful because oh, kids everybody like kids deserve love from everyone unconditionally you know yeah. like they yeah yeah like, it's so easy <laughs> like kids are so easy right well, you're so easy to just be around and you know we've gone camping on camping trips together <laughs> just like you really oh, you make heart of gold that like just Olivia just adores you and Jackson and Andy <laughs> like all of you are just so amazing here <laughs> she loves going over to your house and hanging out and we recently celebrated a Canadian Thanksgiving together because of you I just I'm grateful like which is actually today today by the way. But we're recording this so, so the day that we're recording this is also Indigenous Peoples Day um in, mm. in the U.S. um 
Yeah. And I know it's still marketed as Columbus Day, but um, anyway, yeah. that's a whole other podcast. That's a whole other, thing, a whole other I... set of things. Uh, <laughs> oh. anyway, in Canada, though, today is Canadian Thanksgiving. Yeah. Um, but we always yeah. do Canadian Thanksgiving the weekend early because mm -hmm. yes, we do this and and yeah, um, just make it fun. But anyways, yeah, and I just yeah. want to also um talk a little bit about one of the ways that you've shared with me that you healed through your grieving is through quilting and sewing. Can you share? Because <laughs> you're making a very special project for me, which again I've been crying this whole episode. Just <laughs> for anyone who's like doesn't see me, I've been losing it the whole time. But I am. What you're doing for me, and I know how much it helped you. And yeah, your so um, the year the year after, one of the things like I'd always said that I wanted to, um, I'd always kind of gotten this idea that I wanted to make a t-shirt quilt for Jackson. Um, not that I had quilted or done any kind of sewing since like eighth grade, um, <laughs> back when they still had home ec. Not to eighth right. Grade. But anyways, <laughs> um, I made an apron then, uh, <laughs> and so I asked for my birthday for a sewing machine and Andy and Jackson got me, you know, all this stuff. And I thought it was going to be so easy. Like I'd seen all these pictures of t-shirt quilts and stuff, but what I didn't realize was people making those shirts were using like all large, like same size, whatever. But when you're making a t-shirt quilt for kids, yeah, generally they're all different sizes. And so I like literally fumbled my way through between YouTube and like my own instincts. Andy had to teach me how to thread the machine because I watched a video like 18 times and was still like I don't understand where <laughs> now it's like boop, boop, boop. yeah 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 time, my brain just somehow could not yeah look. right um but so that started me down the path and it, it made me realize like a part of why I wanted to do that so I'm very sentimental we you know like we'd hung on to all these shirts from traveling yeah. um, that we had gotten Jackson since he was little because we love to travel um and so that was one way to keep them in a more like tangible, meaningful way for him. Cause like, as he gets older, giving him a pile of t-shirts when he's 20 is going to be like, thanks for this garbage. Um, and so instead like turned into a quilt, which he used for a long time. And we still mm -hmm. have. Uh, yeah. yeah. That now. Um, and then I started making quilts, you know, for, for friends and things just for yeah. fun and realized like, A, like I love the creative aspect of it, um, but also I love capturing like those moments and the memories and frankly, like the love that you can through these creative art projects, right? Yeah. Um, and yeah. then not only can they, you know, be used if you want, or they can become art or they can be handed down through generations. Like one of the other quilts that I did, um, the game goes back to telling stories, but this woman that lives in our neighborhood, she had put on Facebook, she had this like torn up in rough shape baby quilt because it's yeah. like 30 plus years old. Yeah. And it had these big holes and tears. And she's like, you know, could anybody fix this? Yeah. So I, I took it and when I went to meet with her and get the the um, torn blanket from her and stuff, she told me the story about how it was her daughter's quilt and her daughter now has seven children of her own. Wow. And, you know, uh, three three of her own and the four adopted, right? So like these, these folks are doing a lot. Um, and how, you know, she wanted to fix it up to give it to her daughter for Mother's Day and, and mm -hmm. things. And so I was like, great, no problem. And their favorite color is purple. There was no purple on this blanket. Um, but I ended up taking it and there was no way to just, you know, patch it up a little bit yeah. and to take it all apart and redo it. Um, but I added to like over the holes and things, I added nine hearts, two big mm. ones, and then seven little ones. Um, again, it was it had a purpose because it was covering up these holes, but it also, yeah. you know, was to reflect her daughter's own story of motherhood mm. and, and things like that. Um, and yeah, so it, and then to like see Debbie's face when I brought it back yeah. to her it was, yeah. you know, like it makes my heart so happy and, yeah. you know, talking about your quilt. So I'm making a quilt for your, for you right now out of your mother's old t-shirts. And yeah. um, it, you know, it was interesting because much like me, I think your mom liked some particular like warm colors and wore them a lot um, in terms of the pinks and the blues and the yeah. black and, and yeah. green. Stuff. Um, <laughs> but it was like, I was trying to figure out what to do because they're just plain t-shirts. So it's not like you have yeah. a focal point or anything. Right. Else. She wore bright colors and had a lot of them. <laughs> yeah. And like, yeah. and just, 
anyhow, and so, you know, in terms of putting things together and, and even like you've been giving input and then just trying to take that a little bit further, yeah. you know, yeah. um, so that in the end, hopefully it'll be something mm. that, you know, you can, as opposed to sitting in a pile of your mom's old shirts and everybody right. what you're doing, you know, you can, can have, right. it can be something to help comfort you. Cause I know well, how close you were and how hard yeah. it is. Yeah. Thank them. you. <clears throat> I mean, it makes me, like you were saying thank you this weekend and it's like as it's coming together I get so excited especially when it's like oh it looks so cool and you know <laughs> the different pieces and yeah. and then just that like again that whole feeling of like you know seeing you and then getting to do that for you like that fills my heart with like mm-hmm. so much warm fuzziness right mm-hmm. and, and yeah so it's it's kind of funny because I think that people always think of quilts as being like that thing that their grandmother did. Um, right. There's definitely ways to make it, you know, modern, but also it is to like yeah. tie in those things, right? And to create yeah. those sort of more practical or tangible ways of reflecting those memories and moments and love, right? Um, mm-hmm. I so. appreciate you so much. I mean, look at how this creative act of quilting and and stitching sewing like what it's leading to I mean it's helped you in your healing it's helping others like myself and you're creating a whole new business kind of through sewing too I mean like well and so one of the things that ties to the the, like so yeah so I'm in the middle of starting a new business um Mm -hmm. to that is basically like fabric creative arts because it is like we've done like pet stuff Um, But really, like, where my heart is, is in doing those commemorative types of pieces for folks. Um, Yeah. If anybody wants a custom dog holler, custom dog (laughs) hollers, like, reach out to me or cat collars. Like, I will connect you with Cass because they're named Um, after your two dogs. And it's so cool. And soon we'll have. But so one of the things I want to do, and this is part of the larger business plan when I launch, is that Mm -hmm. with every one of the, like, quilts that I sell or, like, the, the collars and stuff for the animals, um, for the animals, then it's going to a puppy shelter here that I got both of my dogs from. Um, but we want to either do like a one for one, like, so if you buy a collar, then a collar will go to oh, that's amazing. The, the shelter. Um, or I haven't figured out if it makes more sense to do that or if like a percentage mm. of money, but that is one of the pieces. And then the other pieces with the quilts, I want to use my scraps to make Nick NICU quilts because like when it, like, um, and then so with each quilt that we sell we will donate one to like one of the uh, um neonatal units nearby oh. um so that folks like because when like I said when we went through our loss obviously like we didn't have any of our stuff it wasn't my bag wasn't packed like things were early um and I understand that even you know when there's stories like ours but when there's also like the really joyous stories where you know, babies live, you're not always ready and you don't always have stuff. And so there are folks who put together these packages and, you know, we inherited essentially these two really beautiful knitted blankets. And that was what gave me sort of the idea of how it could tie to what I'm doing. And as you know, like I, I save all of the fabric (laughs) until I actually can't use anything anymore. Mm -hmm. And so I figured that's a good way to like, again give back to the community because I think it's so so important um anytime mm-hmm. you're doing sort of anything to find ways to you know yeah serve others I guess um you're just amazing Cass I just love you so much <laughs> hey it works both ways lady like you Aww. inspire me all the time and Aww. just you know like I said you're like I'm gonna do this and then you're like oh I did it and that's you know just so inspiring and the way that you are thank you, you know, putting your heart and soul in thank you thank you so much I just this conversation like I I have never cried this much and oh <laughs> I'm honestly I just, amazed I'm, that I'm holding it together as well as I wow. am and I just want to like have you if you're if there are any final kind of words you'd love to leave a woman who may be in the waiting who maybe have experienced loss and you know your motherhood journey it became something maybe not planned it's just so beautiful like how it's all unfolded and are there any kind of words that you'd love to leave a woman with who may be listening so I guess 
one of the things that I think was so, so important, um, well, two things is one is to know that you are not alone. And I think if you found this podcast, then you already are starting to understand that. But it's not just that you're not alone, you know, on the journey, if you're going down the IVF road or any of those things. I mean, chances are, by the time you get to IVF, you've been through some stuff. Yeah. And yes. Just know that even in those things, you're not alone. Like one of the things I learned when we for our first miscarriage, right? You start like all of a sudden you start doing research and learning like, oh, wait, I'm not, you know, I'm 20% of women. That's mm -hmm. a huge percentage of women. And yet mm -hmm. we, every miscarriage is treated like, oh, don't talk about it. Mm -hmm. you know? And like, if people have, you know, taken the step to share that news and then they have a loss, like that can be really challenging. Um, but just know that you're a not alone. There are tons and tons of resources and other women um, that can support you on that. And then, I mean, even in going through IVF and all of those things, and in all those moments of being not sure, just trust that however things work out, it it really probably is maybe not your ideal, but in the end, it's your life. And you learn to appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, there's lots of things, like I said, I would never, it's not like, oh, I'm thankful that I, you know, right. that this happened to my children, but, um, it, it has given me a perspective, um, and I feel like has, you know, just being more open to talking about it and it makes people really, I think, uncomfortable sometimes because I am like in appropriate moments, I am pretty open about what's mm -hmm. happened. Mm -hmm. Um, and I will tell women about it and, and all of those things. Um, but it's also like sometimes in not saying anything, that's okay too. Um, cause again, it goes back to, and I'll put this on others of how you respond to women who go through these things mm -hmm. or who are going through these things. Right. Um, because there's a lot that we can do to support women going through these difficult things that isn't, you know, patronizing and isn't yeah. pitying them because their experience is not as easy. Like we all know the woman who like snoozes and gets pregnant and then has, you know, like those women exist and great, but like that doesn't make you any less of a woman because you're going through difficulty. Mm. Yeah. So, I'm so grateful to you, Cass. I love you. And I love you too. Yeah. I appreciate um, you and, and the fact of, you know, wanting to share all of the aspects. Because as you know, when we first talked about it, I was like, I don't understand how my story is going to help. <laughs> you know, like, oh, I know. It's, but it was that whole thing of, you know, then talking about it. And again, recognizing that even just talking about things that are difficult it's raising that awareness and, yeah. and creating those hopefully places and spaces that are safe for women and that they feel accepted regardless yeah. of what their experience has been, or even those women who know they don't want to have kids and yeah. not yeah. to be moms. Like that's okay. Right. too. Well, I thank you for saying yes to sharing your story. It's so needed. You're helping so many people. So I can't wait to hug you when I see you. I know. <laughs> I love you, Cass. I love you. Thank you. Bye.